Welcome to the lecture on classification. Today we're going to talk about one of the most important tasks in supervised machine learning. Um, another important task in supervised machine learning is regression. And the main difference is that with classification we have distinct categories, classes, and we try to separate the data points into these classes Whereas in regression, we try to predict a real value. We try to predict a number. So today, our focus is also on classification. And it's quite intuitive, right? I mean, imagine a machine learning system that takes images as input and then det decides whether this is a cat or a dog. Conceptually, it's quite simple. However, if we look at some theory behind this, and here we have Elena Roche, for instance, she said the most interesting aspect of this classification system is that it does not exist. Certain types of categorization may appear in the imagination of poets, but they are never found in the practical or linguistic classes of organisms or of man-made objects used by any of the cultures of the world. So I'm showing you this to kind of give you a feeling we are again defining a task, right? We make an abstraction and we decide that this is a relevant distinction that we want to make. And that's what classification is all about. It's also quite complex if you even look at the animal example that I gave you in more detail, because there are different hierarchies of knowledge. And the question is at which level do we want to model? The bird on the left, we can of course refer to it as the basic level as a bird, but there's also a superordinate level, right? It's also an animal. There's also a subordinate level. It's also called American robin. It's all the same bird. It's the same instance, but it's different classifications for that particular instance. The same with the penguin. It's also an animal. It also has its particular name, for instance, chinstrap penguin here in English, but many people might not immediately say bird to a penguin. They will much rather just call it a penguin. And the question is, how do we determine these category names and how many differences do we want within a category? It's all a modeling question. It's all world making. It's you making decisions about the world that really have an effect that change the way the system perceives the world. And here's just another example for such an hierarchy and how they relate. Um, it can be quite helpful to have these hierarchies, but when you make a classification system, it's really important for you to think about the level that you're trying to model. Again, there are two big streams in machine learning that we will talk about in this class. Is supervised learning. And with supervised learning, we have features, we have our X, and we have classes, we have a Y that we're trying to predict. And again, the goal is predictions. So we have pixel values about different animals, and we have classes, we have labels where we say this is a dog and this is a cat. And then the goal is prediction. There's also unsupervised learning, and we're going to learn about that in the lectures on clustering, and dimensionality reduction. And here we only have the features, and the goal is exploration, right? We try to find similarities between the features. There's also many other tasks, for instance, reinforcement learning that we won't talk about with the scope of this class, but which is also part, an important part of machine learning. Let's consider a practical example. And it's a serious example, to be honest. So the topic here is breast cancer. What we have are different cells, tissue cells, and we try to make a classification whether a tumor is benign or malignant. Benign means gutartig in German, so that's not so bad, and malignant means bösartig, that's the bad kind of cancer. And we try to make those predictions based on the data that we have. And for that we take particular features. So here uh, we have the mean area of pixels and the mean number of concave points. So some information about the shape of the points 
and some information about the size of the points. And you can find this here, right? We have the shape and we have the size. And we have the different classes here. And for the benign tumors, the good ones, we label, we make a blue cross. Uh, and for the malignant ones, we make a red plus. And everybody intuitively can already see that there seems to be some relation in the data, right? So if the mean area of pixels reaches a certain threshold, let's say a thousand, and the mean number of concave points is above 0 0.10, we mostly, we almost only see malignant tumors. Whereas if the number is quite small, let's say less than 500 and less than 0 0.3, let's say, we only see benign uh, tumors. So what you could be doing here is just really draw a line through the data. And with that line, we decide whether the tumor is benign or malignant. Surprisingly, that's exactly what we're doing with machine learning. It gets more complicated than line fitting, but intuitively, that's really the core idea, right? We try to fit a line through the data with which we make a decision about the different classes. <coughs> Let's consider an even simpler example before we go to the math of fitting the line. There's an even simpler algorithm, which is called the k-nearest neighbors algorithm. And the idea here is to just look at the neighborhood the, in the Euclidean space, in the vector space of the different points. So here again, let's pretend we have the mean number of concave points and the size of the um, tumor. Blue, again, benign, red, malignant. So the idea is quite intuitive. If we have a new data point, for instance, the stars here, we just look at the values that are the most close to all the training points that we know. For instance, for the one for the blue uh, star, we find there's a blue point quite close in our training data that we labeled as benign. So we take the star and we also label it as benign. We make it blue. The one on the right, that's uh, close to the 10 on the x-axis, um, we look in the neighborhood and we find there's a malignant training data point very close to that point. So we labeled that one red as malignant. So what we're doing here is quite intuitive and in a way it's also what a doctor might be doing, right? They look at cases they've seen before and they compare the data that you, they, they compare the new patient to the patients that they've seen before. And by that they make a decision. Now what you can also see is what we will refer to as structural risk. For the data point on the top left, right, the, the blue star, we can see that while the closest point is indeed benign, there's a lot more malignant points close to the point than benign points. So it's closer to the red triangles close to 5 on the y-axis than the circles close to the 2 on the y-axis. So one mitigation for that for this being fooled by the closest point, is just to take more than one point into account. It's a very simple idea. So instead of just looking at the nearest neighbor, the first nearest neighbor, or one nearest neighbor, we look at three. And then we can vote, right? And you can see it sort of changes the prediction here, especially with the data point that I talked about, the one close to four on the y-axis and eight on the x-axis that changed from being classified as benign to being classified as malignant. You can also see that for the other point that we considered, that is on the, let's say, x equals 10 and y equals approximately 3, that we also take a benign data point into account. So here we also take additional information into account. You probably already noticed that we did not consider two nearest neighbors, and the reason for that is just that we can't do a majority vote. We want an odd number so that we're able to do a majority vote. We can also take a lot more neighbors into account. 
We can take as many as we want. As I said, usually it's odd numbers. And what we see here is again the feature space. And we said that the feature Y was the mean air size of the tumor and the feature one was the number of concave points. And what we see here in the lighter shades, in the light blue and the light red, is the decision boundary. So that's for all the values, all the possible values, um, an estimation of how we would decide for these. And what we want to do in machine learning is to minimize our structure risk. Uh, we don't want to be too specific to individual data points. We want to make good generalizations. What you also see here is a fundamental problem of machine learning because when we do classical programming, let's say imperative programming, where we have a lot of rules and we're very explicit and we know for every data point what's going to happen. Here we don't know that. And here we have a lot of false positives and false negatives. And that's a very important consideration in machine learning because again, like with the breast cancer, it can have huge influences on the lives of people. And here's some more real data with more than two classes. Of course, sometimes you have more than three different classes. And uh, so that's what we're doing here. And then you see the decision boundary of the nearest neighbor classifier. And you can kind of see this dynamic with the generalization that I was referring to uh, for the just the nearest neighbor, the one nearest neighbor classifier that we see in the middle. We have these little islands where we're, where we're very specific to individual data points, whereas with the five nearest neighbor classifier, we get like big blocks for which we make decisions. And that's quite preferable because there's always outliers in the data. There's always examples that are not as canonical, that are very specific. So we want to generalize and we don't want to be overly specific to individual data points. Yeah, it's just a, uh, a recap of the nomenclature that I already introduced. Again, we're talking about features, attributes, or dimensions for the X and classes and targets for the Y. And each individual data point, each individual tumor cell, let's say, is called an instance. And for each instance, we do have features and we have classes, right? We have the number of concave points and we have the area in pixels. And that's our features. And then we have the assessment, whether it's benign or malignant, and that's our classes. Let's talk a bit more about theory, about uh, how we refer to these things. So for that, I would like to do some more definitions. So if we do classification, our goal is to predict a discrete valued quantity Y in a binary classification that's either minus one or plus one or zero or one. And for multi-class classification, y can be from 1 to k. And this k can be quite large. If we look at ImageNet and when we look at it uh, in the computer vision lecture a bit, we can have millions of different classes easily. So what we're trying to do conceptually is that we have a concept, the concept C that we're trying to learn. And the C is a mapping to the values zeros of one for all the x in our training data. And for the c, we also have a hypothesis, which is the result of our learning, which is the guessed c. And again, that's a mapping of our data x to the classes zero and one. And this hypothesis is part of the hypothesis space large h. So there's all conceivable hypotheses all the machine learning models that we could come up with. Uh, and it's a very, very large number. And we try to narrow it down, mathematically speaking, to the best hypothesis and the best guest S, that is C, and the best guest C, that's the closest to the C that we have. And we also don't have all the available data, right? We have training data, we have a subset of the real data. So our D is a subset of the available data. Could also be all the available data, but it's highly unlikely. Now, some more definitions. We have possible example, possible, 
positive examples. Uh, and that's where the concept of x equals 1, it's a positive example, let's say a benign tumor, and we have negative examples, C, Cx equals 10, which is a malignant tumor. And just to give you a feeling of the combinatorics behind this, just how many possible data points, how much variation we can have in data. We have a small example here from Ilyan Erkeberg from Stockholm. And here's a system that's basically trying to predict how good the weather is. And we have some different attributes, some features that we use. We have information about the sky, about the temperature, about the wind and the humidity. And for instance, the wind can be either windy or calm. And this is a very simplified example. But as you can see, even here, there's a lot of possible weather conditions. So just the combinatorics of the different features is already a large space. <coughs> and we could have some typical training examples for this weather prediction system. It could be sunny, warm, windy, and dry. And then we say, well, that's nice weather. It could also be rainy, cold, windy, and humid. We consider that bad weather or sunny, warm, calm, humid, which we consider nice weather. So these are all combinations of the possible combinations that we then get as actual training samples. And then our goal is to map the training data X to the best possible hypothesis. So here on the left, we have the training data as a set. And on the right, we have all the possible hypotheses as another set. And what we're trying to learn theoretically, conceptually, is really just a mapping from the data to the best hypothesis that's representative of the concept C that we're trying to learn. The question is, of course, now how many hypotheses can we choose from? And that's always with this binary example, 2 to the power of uh, x. And as you can see, it's quite a large number. I'm not going to read it out. But um, yeah, so the question is, how do we make restrictions? How can we constrain this? And we already saw two ways of doing that. One is the line fitting into the data. Um, and the other one would be uh, looking at examples and working from examples like we did with the key nearest neighbors. So now that you get a feeling about classification, I would really like you to consider this example. So these are handwritten digits, just a bunch of numbers that somebody wrote down, for instance, while writing a letter, while writing down the zip code on a letter. And I want you to imagine that your job is to write a tool, write a software that can automatically recognize these handwritten digits in the programming paradigms that you know, right? Let's say object-oriented programming or functional programming. How would, you do, how would you go about it? And I would like you to pause the video now for, let's say, five minutes and really try to sketch out a solution. And then we continue here. So yeah, welcome back. I don't know if you paused. I hope you did. But um, the important thing that I want you to take away from this thought experiment is there's a lot of variation, right? Even for us who, can, who learned these numbers in school, and you can basically formulate some rules, right? A zero, that's mostly a circle. An eight, that's two circles on top of each other. A one, that's just a line. Um, yeah, and then there's like different combinations of the things. Um, like we know how to describe these uh, lines. And you could imagine just taking the pixels and doing some sort of template matching. But even if you do this template matching on the values that you consider, you find that there's a lot of variation. You can find that there's zeros which are very, very stretched or very, very squeezed, which don't really look like circles anymore. They look much more like ones. You have ones that are tilted a bit. So there's a lot of variation. And of course, in the classical programming paradigm, you could then add rules and rules and rules and make exceptions for this and exceptions for that. But this will inevitably fail and it's a lot of effort. So the idea, again, of the whole machine learning endeavor is to learn from data. And I'm going to show you some one more way of implementing this. 
or like some more examples, let's say first. So again, one example is a spam filter of a classification system where we have a bunch of emails and we have the machine learning system and then we make a decision, right? We have two classes, it's either spam or ham, like the, the not spam. And here the X, the attributes could be, um, let's say the words in an email. It could also be metadata about who sent the email, when the email was sent, and a lot of other factors. And we have these two distinct classes. We already know the example uh, with breast cancer that we looked at. Here we have the tissue sample as an attribute, which is the Gewebeprobe, and then this classification between benign and malignant. So let's reconsider this example that I already gave you and see on how we would actually implement it in this line fitting paradigm. Again, I showed you this mean area of pixels and the mean number of concave points. And what we're trying to do is really to draw a line in the data to have this decision boundary or separating boundary with which we then make a decision whether something is benign or malignant. And what you see here is really, it's just fitting a line, right? It's just a line with an, an offset, you know, starting close to 0 0.12 or 0 0.11 and uh, a slope going down. And that's just like any kind of line that you see, right? It's the slope times x plus the offset. It's really basic math. It's just a line that's fit into a two-dimensional um, coordinate system. So the question is, how do we do this? How uh, will this look mathematically? But first we consider how we actually know whether our decisions are good. Because if you look at this, you see that yes, most of the malignant training data points are on the light red side. That means that we classify them as malignant. And yes, most of the benign training data points that we know are on the benign data set aside of the light blue decision boundary. But, and this is really important, there's a lot of different data points that are on the wrong side. And these are errors. And in machine learning, we have a particular vocabulary to reason about these errors. And it's mostly derived from statistics, but we need to learn this to actually be able to talk about our data science systems. So let's say for the cancer example, with the benign and malignant data points, we have the so-called true positives. And these are elements that are correctly predicted as benign. Right? Or like we, we basically decide one class is the, the more important one. So let's say here for us, benign is what we're trying to predict. That's the more important one. So that's what we call the true positives. And then we have the true negatives. These are the elements correctly predicted as malignant. And our accuracy is how many of the benign ones we predicted as benign and how many of the malignant data points we predicted as malignant over all the elements that we have. And that's one of the most important uh, measures, metrics in machine learning. And we're also going to learn some others which might be more precise and more fitting depending on the context and the distribution of the data. But let's first consider the accuracy. Now, this is back in the k nearest neighbor example, and it kind of shows you that how many predictions we do, how many of our predictions are correct, depends on our parameters. So if we look at the neighbors that we considered, we can see that our testing accuracy and that's the accuracy on data points that we haven't seen before, is highly dependent on the number of neighbors that we took into account. So the model and its performance is dependent on some hyperparameters, and hyperparameters are decisions that we made about our data set. And you can see that it's the lowest if we take two neighbors into account. And as I told you before, you want odd numbers, so you can do a majority vote, which gives a lot more expressivity to your model. And we can see that it's uh, quite high uh, for values around six and seven. So that's also funny because of course, 
the majority vote can't be done with the six, but it just shows you that there's no perfect parameter. The rule that you want odd numbers to do a majority vote remains, but still on our testing accuracy, on the actual decision that we fit, the number six actually outperformed all the others. You also see that there's a huge difference between our training accuracy and our testing accuracy. So this is an important thing that we need to make clear again. We train our model on the training data, on some data that we use for the training, and then we take some part of the data that we have available to make uh, an estimate about the generalization capabilities, and that's the so-called testing data. So we take the entire data and we separate it into two points, right? Two parts. Let's say we take 80% for the training, uh, which, which is the data points that we consider as neighbors. And then we take 20% of the available data and we see how well this actually works on data that we haven't seen before. Uh, and that's a way for us to estimate the generalization capabilities of these models. And what you see is that there's a difference between the accuracy in training and accuracy in testing. And that's the so-called generalization error, the out-of-sample error. And you can see it's the largest for the two neighbors. It's also still high, uh, quite high for just taking one neighbor into account. And you see that these numbers eventually converge. And that's for the k-nearest neighbor values between 6 and Eight, but then they also diverge again and even the training accuracy goes down. And we will consider this a lot because the part on the left is what we consider underfitting. That means our model is not generalizing well enough. And the part on the right is what we call overfitting. So we have a situation where our model becomes too, too specific to the data and does not generalize well anymore. On the left, we have a so-called overfitting situation where our model is highly specific to the training data. It's basically just memorizing the training data and uh, it's not good at making generalized decisions. If we look at the model on the right, it is maybe underfitting because there's a lot of benign and malignant data points that are not recognized in the data set. So we always have to make a trade-off and there will always be data points that we misclassify. It's almost inevitable. And it's just something that we have to deal with. And it's also something that we have to be thoughtful about. And there's these two things. And there's terms for it to refer to it. There is the so-called bias. And that's an error that stems from wrong assumptions in the learning algorithm. And that's the so-called underfitting. That's our model not generalizing, not learning enough to actually make predictions. That's the so-called bias. And then there's the so-called variance. And that's overfitting. That's an error that comes from sensitivities to small fluctuations in the training set. And as I hinted already, there's always a trade-off, right? There's the so-called bias-variance trade-off. Ideally, you want a system with low bias and low variance, right? Where you really hit on the target. But usually you either have a strong model and then you have a high bias and then you get low variance, but then you might not hit the target perfectly or you hit the target, but you have a high variance, which means that um, you still make a lot of errors because there's just so much fluctuation in the data that your model picks up on. What you don't want is of course a model with high bias and high variance, that's just wrong, but you basically have to decide which, uh, whether you take uh, a model with strong assumptions and then you have the risk of a high bias or you take a model with high variance and then you have the low bias, but then you might uh, have some problems there. It's always a trade-off. You can look at the source in the bottom to get more information on this. And I just want you here to give get you some more intuition on the line fitting and also some background because it sounds very basic and of course this is just an example 
to give you an intuition on how these things work in principle. Because here the line fitting is quite an interesting and easy idea. And you can find that in a lot of models, especially support vector machines, where we try to really find a line that goes through the data set. We have some parameters x, so we have the slope for the parameters, that's the w, and we have the offset, which is the b. And the idea is really to have this formula for a line, and whenever the value is bigger than 1, then we say t is 1, or when it's smaller or equal uh, minus 1, then we say it's minus 1, right? So when uh, the, we want this line, this equation, to be larger than 1 when we have a training point that we know is benign, and we want it smaller than minus 1 if we have a dating data point that is um, malignant. Now, in practice, the data set that I showed you, the breast cancer data set, which you're actually going to work on yourself, you're going to train a model to detect uh, breast cancer, which is quite cool, I hope. Um, that's not just taking two things into account, because then we would just really be able to make a visualization and give this to a doctor, as we do this in high dimensions. And here is an example of a plane, right, an Ebene in German. Uh, a plane that goes through uh, the data. And with that, you could be able to distinguish three different data points, not just two things, but three things. But our data set will have much, much more than that. 30 dimensions, 50 dimensions, 100 dimensions. So what we're doing is actually fitting a so-called hyperplane. It's the same idea as a plane. It's a similar equation. And it's very hard to visualize because we can only see three dimensions with three. But uh, yeah, what we're doing in theory is to show you uh, to, to actually fit a hyperplane with which we subdivide the space. But again, it's really the same idea as here, right? We're drawing a line through the data, but we do that for many, many data set data points, not just the two that we considered in this example. Now. Just for you to understand and to, to check your knowledge, I want you to look at these five different models and think about which model is the best. And again, please pause the video and um, yeah, think about it a bit. Now, there's different answers to this actually, and um, it's quite intuitive why that is. I think the in the most neutral way the model c would be the best generalization um, because it has the largest margin between the two data sets and you want to maximize the margin that's the goal in many machine learning applications so what's really good about that system that model is that it separates the margin quite nicely and there's a good separation between the different data sets However, if you're in a setting like breast cancer detection, there is different cause to different errors. If you tell a woman that she has breast cancer and you give her treatment and it turns out that she doesn't have it, that's inconvenient and uh, definitely not a nice situation for the person. Um, but uh, it's much, much worse to have somebody who has breast cancer who you don't give the treatment. So what you want is in this setting is much rather to have a system close to the boundary B where you may be much more likely to call out somebody as having breast cancer uh, and then giving them treatment um, than just detecting them as not having breast cancer. For the model D for instance we see that we're that uh, it's not really generalizing well for the idealized example that we're looking at, right? So the, the decision boundary is really not so nice. And that means it's very, very uh, sensitive to fluctuation. So it has high variance. We don't want that. Yeah. And yeah, that's a good distinction, I would say, uh, for these data points. E is okay as well. But uh, yeah, it's just a different way of fitting and it depends on the data.